What you're trying to do in the first part of positioning is occupy a distinct place in a potential customer's mind. So if the customer and I can, can identify that what you do is unique, you're in a great place. But if they say, oh, there's 10 other vendors who help with compensation, we've got a challenge. And that's where you go on to the second thing, which is to say, well, what unique white space can I find in the marketplace? Now, for those of you here in the value prop session, we actually spent a bunch of time discussing this. And so I'm not going to go through this all again. You can find it again on the website. We talked about how can you write that out in a way that at least positions you for a unique set of customers with a product that is differentiated, that does something that's not been done before, unlike the other competitors, and talks a little bit about the whole product, in other words, the entire solution that you delivered to, to make that possible. So with that in mind, I want to bring Mark up uh, from his experience at Spotfire uh, and as part of the TIBCO organization to talk a little bit about how did he do this, and then I'll come and generalize it and try to address uh, your opportunity. Mark, welcome. Thank you, Michael. Um, <clears throat> you know, positioning statements like this, they, they may look academic when you're in the audience looking at these frameworks, but I can tell you they're far from academic. You really do need to, to get a handle on how you're going to, you know, how do you want to position and how do you want to differentiate your, your product or solution out there. And I think you should go through this early and often, frankly. You know, particularly when, you know, when you're forming, when you're launching, when you're pivoting. A lot of organizations, you know, when you start a startup, you know, the, the ultimate path that you're on is very unlikely to be the one that you start on. So when you sense that the organization is going to go through a change, is going to try to reach a different market, a different buyer, come up with a new solution, I think it's good and healthy to go through these, these sorts of exercises. In fact, <clears throat> I'm going through uh, one with a new management team that I'm on tomorrow. I've been uh, with one of Michael's portfolio companies for about two weeks. And our organization is going through a pretty significant pivot. You know, we're changing the profile and the persona that we go after. So what do you think happens? These things unwind, right? When you, when you, when you try to reach a new buyer, you're thinking about the value that you offer. You have to go through and think about each line. Each word in this framework should be meaningful and mean something. And I think when you get it right, they're so aligned with the opportunity and the, the value that you're conveying in the market and the differentiation over a competitor, that if you were to read it from a competitor's standpoint, the whole thing would fall apart. It wouldn't make sense. So Mark, just to give people a bit of a, an opportunity to get a sense of it, what did Spotfire do and, and why was this tough for you and how did you solve the, the problem here? Yeah, good question. So Spotfire um, was a private company. We were acquired by TIBCO in 2007. Um, about 2005, we went through a very significant pivot. I had recently joined the company. Uh, we were targeting mostly scientific users in the data visualization space, right? So we were selling to small teams of people, scientists, you know, people in corners of organizations. We wanted to pivot and go after the executive ranks. We wanted to sell into the business intelligence space, which had, um, you know, bigger budgets, bigger dollars. We believe we could get more scale. We thought the product itself would be able to serve those needs. But we were virtually unknown in that space. Anybody who knew that brand thought about us as a scientific and a technical, and a technical product. And as often as the case as founders or early stage people, you love the features. So people tend to gravitate to talking about what the product or the solution does, not what it does for the target buyer. So when you go through exercises like this, you want to think about who are we really, really trying to reach? There may be a number of personas, but you have to pick one. You can't segment too tight, especially in an early stage organization. So who are we trying to go after? What keeps them up at night? What are they dissatisfied with that's going to be enough for them to call us back or to do a web search to try to find us or to respond to a, an outbound you know, email or call or something like that? How is our approach different than the competition? What lines can we take that our nearest competitor can't? And as Michael had pointed out, often when you're an early stage company, you're solving things that are being approached by other companies as well. And we've just got a different take on it. And for us, we were going up against Cognos and Business Objects and Hyperion, really well-funded organizations, you know, big marketing budgets. We were never going to get there by saying that we were another business intelligence tool. We took a slightly different angle, which was around focusing on the value of decisions that people would make in our product. Using Spotfire, we could help people make 
better decisions. And that was the value statement. And I'd say, you know, Jameis's points were right on. That was the elements of the brand. We were fun to use, we were easy, we would enable users to make better, smarter decisions in every corner of the company. And that's what we ended up really focusing on the, you know, on this, on the positioning statement. And we as a management team fought through this thing. It was ugly. Thank you very much, Mark. Okay. So hopefully that gives you, yeah. And by the way, the business intelligence space that um, Mark was competing for was a very, very noisy space with very big players. And yet, Mark's team was very successful at finding their unique positioning and being very successful at building the business around it. Yeah, question. Did you have to rebrand it to, so that people now thought of Spotfire as something for the business and for the research scientists? Oh, oh yes. Oh. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, we did, there was definitely a rebranding effort, for sure. And I think you know, going through the same sort of process that, that, uh, uh, that Jameis had, had outlined. But for me, it started here. We weren't going to move forward until we had alignment on the management team here. When we did that, then we started going out in concentric orbits and talking with the organization. But everybody in the company was tested on this. Literally, the CEO would get in your face if you couldn't recite this, this framework. And I mean that. You have to believe it that strongly. And then things like branding and campaigns and programs fall in line. They're much easier to scale up because you're, you're kind of singing from the hymnal here, if you will. The first thing that I see that startups miss is this. Everybody always thinks about that differentiation in terms of technology. It's great that you might have a technology differentiation. In many instances, it's a great starting point, especially if it's a highly disruptive technology. But it doesn't have to be just about technology. You could have some incredibly compelling differentiation just by figuring out a segment that's never been served before. So for example, compensation is extremely complicated in the insurance industry. There's a lot of different channels it goes through. There's a lot of different people have to take a piece out of it. And there's a lot of different ways that that calculation causes so many problems that it gave rise to a whole new set of companies. It, we don't have to go into all that example. But that was a uh, completely new segment that gave opportunity for the business you're in. I would recommend that any business try to find that first segment that nobody else is targeting. That could be your differentiation right there. The second thing is to find some kind of barrier to entry. Because believe me, that once the big guys figure out you're onto something interesting, they're going to come after you. So what is it that could be the barrier to entry? Again, most startups approach this and say, well, we've got a better technology. Great. But if it's just better, faster, cheaper, somebody's going to come after you and spend more money to figure out how to compete with you uh, at scale. And so that isn't a good answer either. But what's interesting is that there are many things, and we've talked about one of them, if you were in our business model session, that is very difficult for the existing incumbents to come after. In fact, the larger they are, the more likely they are to be titanically slow at responding. And one of them is business model. If you create a disruptive business model that creates a dis, uh, an innovator's dilemma, the great book I encourage you to read if you haven't read it from Clayton Christensen, you will see that this is an example where even independent of your technology, if you come, for example, with an open source solution the way our case study Acquia did at the last uh, discussion, and offer free versus where people are spending literally millions of dollars and therefore are becoming dependent as a business on getting millions of dollars from their sales force and in margin to support their overhead, you will disrupt them. Nothing to do with the technology, to do with the business model. And then last but not least, what we want to try to find is something that becomes sustainable to you. And again, what I hear a lot of the time is, well, we've got IP and patents. It's great. Nothing wrong with that. But I'll tell you, there are so many examples of where startups have better IP and even patents around it. But do you really have the energy and the resources to compete with an Apple or a Google or a Microsoft or whoever it might be in your, in your business, uh, Eli Lilly if you're you know, in the pharma space? No, you don't. And so even though you might have what it takes, are you really going to press it? Wouldn't it be better if you came at it with a completely different approach and you had, for example, the first network, because you'd given away your product free, of existing compensation users that was providing a completely different way to benchmark that nobody had ever done before and that gave you a competitive advantage compared to anybody else that was there because it was free, open, and now fully exploited. And your core IP ended up being not technology at all, but data. Completely different game. That would be defensible because nobody else had it. So I really encourage you not to get stuck in the trap of approaching everything with a technology bias, but instead to think about these key areas uh, as to how to define or redefine the competition in a way that puts you in a position to win. So how do you map that? Well, uh, again, for those of you here for the perfect pitch, I go into this in more detail, but it's up on the web again. 
what I like to do, uh, particularly because we're at Harvard, by the way, is come up with a two by two uh, and think about the high low. And this diagram is pretty simple. It's really about mapping your competitors. You might use, for example, bubble sizing to represent their relative size. Um, but the, Im the important point here becomes the axes. And the axes are always something that people put up in exact ways that we just talked about. Well, we're faster, or we're better, or we're cheaper. It's OK, but it doesn't work in the long run. What we want, however we get there, is to find this white space that nobody else is occupying. That's what we're talking about. I recommend the thing you really spend time on is this. It's the barriers. The barriers should literally cause the competition to say they can't move from where they are to where you are. So what's an example? Is your software SaaS? Yes. OK. Every on-premises solution that's not architected for multi-tenant, remote development, customization, et cetera, is going to find it really hard to move into the cloud and be offered as a service. So on-premise and SaaS is a great example of a barrier. For anybody in the software world who knows what I'm talking about here, I can tell you it's very difficult. That is the entire premise on which a company called Demandware that just presented got to be worth you know, nearly a billion dollars. Why? Because the existing incumbents who were offering e-commerce stacks, which was a lot of technology that was sold on premise, required people to go and build all that technology and customize it. And guess what? Retailers and merchants don't do that. What they spend their time doing is trying to distinguish their brand, merchandise, and market better. And they don't want to deal with all that technology. So that's all pain to them, whereas the gain should be getting straight online and customizing the site to their brand's look and feel. That's all Demandware did. One fundamental barrier between the two, though, which is one's on premise and the other one is obviously uh, in the cloud. So those are the kinds of barriers we're looking for here. And you already got one, which is great. Obviously, if you can think of a couple, and I mentioned before, they might be business model. Uh, or they might be different uh, axes here, then that gives you a chance to put yourself in a position where you will be unique and defensible. 